in Morocco, which was not too far from, from uh, Casablanca, which is a beautiful place. Um, I was stationed there in the Air Force, and, and one day I went to the library to check out some books about writing. And the, my interest in writing at that point came from my experience in staying in Paris for about a week. And I thought I had enough experiences in Paris to write something about that. And so the library, the military library, had a contest going for writing. And so I thought I need to get a book on how to write short stories, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went to the library, and then I came back home with five books on religion, which to this day, I don't know how that transferred from writing to getting books on religion. And I, and I read those books, uh, and I discovered that there was a oneness in the whole thing. They were all saying the same thing. And I just, I was surprised at that. And um, as a result of that, it just kind of stayed in my mind. Fast forward to my leave in Morocco and going back to the States. And I was in Dayton, Ohio. And one morning, as I was still in the Air Force, I um, was preparing to go to work. And I can remember clearly I was tying my tie and watching television, standing up in the middle of the room. And on TV was a man being interviewed. And what he said was something about a world religion. And I thought that was interesting. It was a new world religion, and the name of it was B'nai B'rith. Now, I say B'nai B'rith because I couldn't understand what he really said. But I remembered B'nai B'rith, but it was wrong. That's what I remembered. It's not B'nai B'rith, but it is a world religion. And so that just kind of stayed, you know, in my head with nothing attached to it because I didn't hear the talk. I had to go to work. So I finished tying my tie and I went away. I went to Europe again, stayed for a reasonable amount of time, and uh, England to be specific. And then I came back to Wichita State. I mean, I came back to Wichita, Kansas, where I went to university there. And uh, at the WSU, there was a talk being given, and I read this in the newspaper one evening, and it said, it's about a world religion, and his name was Baha'i. And then that, that's when the clarity came from my B'nai B'rith to Baha'i, and they were showing a movie called And His Name Shall Be One. And so um, I decided to go to that. I tried to get some other friends in the family to attend, and, and uh, most of them didn't want to go, so I went alone. And it was in that setting that I heard for, for the first time words of Baha'u'llah. And it just dumbfounded me. And after the movie was over, he said, are there any questions? And a, and a man across the room, it was in an auditorium, across the auditorium, uh, had a Bible in his hand, so he came prepared. And um, in this Bible, he was reading some things about Jesus. And then his, the first thing he said, though, before he started reading that, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? And that was his question. And then he started reading quotes from the Bible. The gentleman in the front of the room was just stood there smiling and never interrupted and let the guy go on for about five or ten minutes. I don't know how long. And when he finished, he, he told the guy and explained that he agreed with everything the man said. But at the same time, he extended it and took it further. And then I just kind of slumped down in my seat because I was just so taken back with all this new knowledge. And uh, so I went to the back of the room and there were some ladies standing there with some cookies and a sign-in book and some pamphlets. And uh, I looked at the pamphlets and they just didn't have enough information. And I told them, I said, I don't want these pamphlets, I want books, I want real books. And so one lady literally ran out the door and came back with two books, one called The Thief in the Night, the other one was called The Wine of Astonishment. That, later on in reflection, those two books were written by William Sears. I found out later also that William Sears was one that was being interviewed on television many, many times because he was a television personality uh, in the early years of his life. 
And so I put that together that William Sears is, is the one who was giving the information both in Ohio and in the books that I read. And in the process, I read the books over and over. I did other research. I was researching everything from Egyptology to you know, Edgar Cayce, every, everything that I could read. And I had, during that period of time, enrolled in the university as a student. And um, so as I was getting my school work done, my university work done, I recognized that I couldn't get away from these writings of Baha'u'llah. And uh, so I would work on my schoolwork, my university assignments and so forth, from the time I got home at night, which was, I held two jobs and I wouldn't get home till about 9, 9.30. And then I would sleep for an hour to around 10. And then I would start in on my assignments and I would do all my assignments till about one or two in the morning. My first class was at six, 7.30, and I would have to get up like at 6.30 or 6 o'clock at the latest to run for my first class. I would fall asleep around 1 from just exhaustion. But if I picked up those books, then I became wide awake, and then I could not sleep. And so many, many times this happened. And then one this particular time, I did this, and picked up the books again, and I was wide awake, and I continued to read until it was time to go to class. And I had a difference of about 10 minutes before the clock was gonna go off, had not slept all night. And I closed my eyes, saying, waiting for the clock to go off. And then I had a vision. The vision consisted of this giant person with a long robe. Uh, I can only describe it like Abdul Baha robe something long, something, and there was a hood, and the hood hid the face. There was no face. I wasn't like it was a dark face. It was no face. I just didn't look upon the face. What this person did was pick me up in the air like a baby and held me up really high to the sky, and then I could see the sun, and the sun was golden. There was a different golden color to the sky, and then, a, then the earth itself was another color, gold. All was gold, different shades of gold. And then uh, I opened my eye. No, no the, this person said, you must follow the sun, S-U-N. And then I opened my eyes and said, what was that? And then a voice said, you must become a Baha'i. And I said, okay, just like that. So that is my moment of declaring my faith in Baha'u'llah. From that point on, I went to um, uh, look for the Baha'is, which I had no idea where they were since I kept myself isolated. And as I went to look for them, it took me two or three months to find them. And I found them on campus as they were recruiting for um, people to join the Baha'i club. And I went to a table and this young lady said, would you like to join the Baha'i Club? And I said, oh yes, I want to be a Baha'i. And she said, what? And I said, yeah, I want to be a Baha'i. She had no knowledge of me having studied or anything. And she directed me to go to a house which was just off campus. The name of the guy to meet, his name was George Wilson. And who was a very, very good friend of mine and some of you may know him. I think I had declared shortly after enrolling in the university, which was somewhere in August or September of 68, and never signed my card until World Religion Day, 69. From that time on, I became a Baha'i, did all kinds of things, and one of the things I did was travel to the Caribbean. I served on uh, some institutions, I served on the NSA in two different occasions for two different cycles I was living there because I had a total of 15 years there. The travel taught in many islands and I enjoyed the travel teaching. Islands like Nevis, Dominica, Guadeloupe, um, St. Martin, Antigua. But uh, over the years I've, I've um, come back to the States and I've served on other institutions 
in New York, the, the teaching committee in, in West New York for many years. But I also served in St. Louis, Missouri uh, as part of the teaching committee out of St. Louis, or out of this part of the Missouri anyway, and met people like Mary Rowe and um, Bill Wheaties and his wife, Lynn Wheaties. And so those were in the early years be between cycles of going to St. Thomas and serving there. So I, I've done a lot of travel as far as the faith. I've been to the uh, World Congress, which I totally enjoyed. I also went to Haifa just prior to World Congress. And that's when I had my first experience of, of going in pilgrimage. And so I've had two pilgrimages. I'm ready for my third now. Uh, and, I, and I'm considering that strongly. But that brought me back to Kansas City in this last cycle after I retired from the islands and uh, have been teaching here in uh, the Kansas City area for the last 20 years. This is the longest I've stayed in one place, um, being in the Kansas City area. And uh, I've enjoyed it. Um, one of the most enjoyable parts of my staying here has been a part of the Black Men's Gathering and uh, working with the brothers in teaching and, and praying and, and drumming and having a wonderful time in teaching the faith here in Kansas City. And one of the things I've, that's kept me here is my yearning to teach in Kansas City, Kansas. And I just have a very, very strong feeling that that's one of the centers Abdul Baha talks about. And, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to, to teach uh, here in Kansas City because I'm working with some people that I trust, feel comfortable with, that I know uh, are, are wanting to do a similar thing. It's not that others aren't, but this special group of brothers that I work with and just about live with um, or not to be compared with any, many other people I've known as, through the years of being a Baha'i. And so I'm grateful that the Baha'i community has space for people like me to serve and uh, naming some of the people that, I, that I've known over the periods, Maurice and Earl, Vincent, uh, Chester, and, uh, and of course Mel Page, can't forget him. But then there's, there's Vernon Pitchland, and then there's uh, some of the guys that have come and gone that we've appreciated. But more than that, uh, we see in front of us a vision of, of that whole area being challenged by the knowledge of Baha'u'llah. And, and we feel that the opportunity to teach is now, the opportunity to change is now. And so we've been studying for the past year those two letters that were sent um, from the National Spiritual Assembly about the problems in Ferguson, Missouri. And from that, we took the challenge of trying to raise the level of dialogue so that we could have the teaching concepts and skills and capacities to raise a level of dialogue under any circumstances, including race. And that transformation that we know is necessary is slowly coming to a large number of us. And uh, we've been excited about that. We've gone to work with the people in St. Louis we had a gathering in St. Louis of totally of about 30 people. We had a wonderful time. We're looking forward to doing this again in the next month or so and in the Kansas City area. And uh, we're going to raise our level of operation, if you can call it that, the level of understanding and merging the two ideas and the concepts and preparation. You can develop any process that you want that fits the need of the people you're working with. And that's what we've done. And we see a great opportunity to have a multiracial group doing the teaching of the faith in this whole western part of Missouri, as well as the central part and eastern part. So in one sense, we're coming from the two opposite ends of the state of Missouri. And somewhere in the middle, who knows what will happen. But those, those methods that we're challenging are challenging our own focus on who we are. It's challenging our, our own focus on how we speak. It's challenging our ability to, to speak with eloquence and to have dialogue in a manner 
that that is more spiritual yet not not uh, forceful uh, we're we're reading some of the books now that that talk about the ways to do this looking at the forces of darkness and the forces of light and learning how to do that in the sense of understanding your own reality and developing the reality in your own environment and so when you can learn to do those things you are not only changed within yourself but you change your own environment and you have our readings show that we have more control of our environment than we believe that we have. And so learning and understanding that is really a, or appreciating the power of the word, the power of the, the words of Baha'u'llah, powers of thought, and the, how that being and doing is important when you take action on those thoughts that you have. And so I'm looking forward to the next 20 years of doing this and seeing a miraculous change in this state and throughout the world. You, if you were here at the beginning, you, you heard why we established this. And we've been for years trying to put this together. And, and we're just so happy to have done it because I think it's been a very good day. But it's not over yet. This is just the beginning. This is our kind of process that we are doing for ourselves in, in the instance of understanding the black experience. Okay. That's what it's about. That's why we have a diverse group. It's the black experience. It's not so much black people, but the black experience is very important to teach African Americans. When I read that statement, uh -huh. and my first thought was, I found complete um, acceptance and that is, I found it at the BMG. Oh. And I was mm -hmm. talking about how that initially mm -hmm. between black men, there mm -hmm. is a, uh, a cautious, uh, I don't know what the word I use, but there's a cautious suspicion maybe, and also a caution accept mm -hmm. acceptance in, uh, because it's between black men and mm -hmm. you know, but then with, with the black men's gathering, I found it. So mm -hmm. when I come back here now, I mean, in the home, I almost say here, um, and I don't see that within the Baha'i community. I'm not complaining. I'm mostly feel sorry for them. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you don't know who you're dealing with. <laughs> you know, I mean you, you, I mean, you don't know these guys who are the salt of the earth mm -hmm. and are just smart and wise as a whip. Mm -hmm. And if you just would take the time to um, halfway listen and halfway evaluate, then you could, you know, you would recognize that when you dealing with them, you got a soul partner. <laughs> you got a partner. Mm -hmm. And so this workshop was established to kind of collectively look at ourselves and try to understand ourselves and then unite ourselves in this effort with the challenging issue and to come away with ideas of, of being one group. And it's not like some people might have thought there would be all black team doing something. That's not what it's about. It's about understanding the black community. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have the experience of that, which means living with them, working with them, having a daily interaction with them, then you don't understand it or you won't understand it. It can't be taught in school. They don't even try to teach it in school. We're not going to stay on that subject. But Billy was, was, was you know, uh, loving enough to, to come here and do this. The next step of this is going to be planning. It's going to be doing a lot of work and pre preparing to create the kind of environment that one of the letters, I think it's the 4th the fourth of February, that people doing things on their own. Mm -hmm. And this, this group was put together by the, the Sunday um, Dialogue on Grace Group. And, and we have been working with St. Louis, mm -hmm. not strangers to that. But we needed this session mm -hmm. in order to tighten ourselves up and then come up with a plan that can allow us to go out and teach the faith with comfort in a team effort. Is we want to create a plan that we think might be able to be reproduced in another location. Mm -hmm. Take it in. 
Christmas this is all about you and for you and richly deserved by you. And in six words, I want you to tell me what you're feeling, what you're thinking. In six words. <laughs> Back at the black men's gathering. <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> that's, and I said that because we do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do this. Yeah. And if you notice, um, there are moments mm -hmm. when we call in. Mm -hmm. Billy, the other Billy, mm -hmm. would do this mm -hmm. and stand there. Mm -hmm. Billy and Roberts. hundred people mm -hmm. would come mm -hmm. and hug you. Mm -hmm. But you didn't choose to do that. Mm -mm. You were always selected mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. The idea of One Drum World came out of a, a session that we had at the Baha'i Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And we were discussing some of the things that we could do for the Bicentennial. And someone in the group had mentioned having devotions for 48 hours. And I thought that was a good idea. But then the idea was quickly pierced because of the black men's gathering that we ought to have 48 hours of drumming because the spirit of drumming is stronger than regular meditation when you have the spirit in the room. You may have noticed when I was talking about meditation a minute ago that you went into a different space because that's the way our heart is. And the importance about having this whole 48 hours drumming is to meditate on the word of Baha. It's a spiritual thing and, and the drumming is a unifying effect, has a unifying effect and, and if you recognize it and you start to play together, you will start to feel the beauty of the drums within you. It isn't something someone can teach, it's something you feel. And it's that feeling, that spiritual feeling, that we want worldwide. If you drum for justice, if you drum for oneness, it's all the same from a Baha'i perspective. Drumming is a great way to bring peace. Children love it, old people love it, whether you drum with one hand at a time or your elbow, it doesn't matter. If you got two fingers and all you can do is run two fingers on the drum, that's fine. The point is, do it together. Do it with love. Do it with joy. Allow a puff, allow a puff. Baha'is are greeting you, Baha'is are greeting you. A new day has come, a new day has come, Baha'u'llah has come, Baha'u'llah has come. Hello everyone. This is a group that's called Dialogue on Race Group. That's kind of the unofficial, official name we've given ourselves. Um, it's been going on for quite some time. It was going on uh, first at the Baha'i Center in Kansas City. And uh, as we struggled to, to try to make something happen, we just started the conversation about our own experiences on race because it was, it was developed uh, out of Michael Brown's murder. And so we, we start to recognize what we might be able to do to, to clear ourselves up as individuals and recognize that we are dual nature people, we're spiritual beings, and that we have some things that we want to do. And we want to do them because then deep inside of us, we know it's the right thing to do. I personally learned a lot from the time I spent uh, in this group, um, especially America after the reconstruction era, which was something I was not aware of. And then I was able then to educate my family, my husband, my children, 
And um, it was an extremely powerful experience. And out of this also, we've been having uh, devotionals that are focused on uh, race unity. I, I, want, I want to say this, uh, something I learned from the, the people who happen to be white that's on our group, that many of them were very, very angry when they discovered the true history of America. Um, how precious this group is because it allows us to have um, dialogue from the perspective of not judging, not blaming, not shaming anyone for his or her lack of information. We had to come together in a space that was not only safe, but brave because we have had some brave, courageous conversations. Good afternoon, good morning, whatever time it is when you see this. Um, this is our group that's going to talk a bit about intellectual prep, uh, what that is, uh, intellectual preparation for social action. It's a program that's been put together by a Fundiac, an organization that's in Columbia. And uh, it's, it's all about learning how to think, learning how to understand, learning how to transform yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this small group here uh, will be here representing the numbers of people, many, many people who have been through this course. Uh, and I see such possibilities of, of um, using this educational process and understanding for the transformation of the individual as well as the transformation of society. Yes. I think the book just as much as helps you get that look at society and education and what's really going on, but it also helps you look at yourself and it helps you get a better perception of yourself, a better thinking of yourself, a better view of yourself. And there's so many ways that it helped, it helped me because during the time when I first met um, Dr. Lewis, I was still kind of learning about myself. I was kind of figuring out who I was, who I wanted to be. Um, I was I was in eighth grade and I was actually homeschooled for the year. Um, and my basketball coach actually introduced me to Dr. Lewis because she felt this course would really help me out in life. And I felt that it really did. It gives you this entire new look on society and education, but it really helps you personally, which is why I think it would be so beneficial for it to be taught and not even just high schools, but school in general. There's so much of rote learning. If you go look at high school, elementary school, middle school, there is so much rote learning. And these kids really don't want to be at school. Trust me, I'm in school with kids that I know that do not like school. They don't like learning. They don't like coming. The reason that this book is so necessary to education and society is because it helps you understand why education and society and community is so important. It makes you have a new motivation because you cannot better anything unless you better yourself. You can't love anyone or love anything properly without loving yourself first. Baha, 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 Baha. Bahaula, Welcome to Prayers with Purpose. Prayers with Purpose was created after 11 of us went to Haifa to pray for teaching African-Americans the faith and trying to get entry by troops to Black Americans. When we returned, we decided all together because we were still in a prayerful mood after coming back from Haifa, then going to the um, Pupil of the Eye Conference in Nashville, and then coming back to Kansas City and St. Louis and other places, we decided we need to continue this spiritual path that we put ourselves on 
and that created prayers with purpose, which you're looking at now. So we come together every Thursday and we just pray with, with love and, and friendliness and, and uh, keep the spirit as much as we can that we had when we were all together in high faith. So dear friends, I am going to echo a little bit what my brother Lewis has said about how we have come together to continue this prayer process. It's been a bounty to be with the friends here that are on the screen. And I can't overemphasize how important this hour is for us. It's the way we rejuvenate ourselves, the way we connect with the Holy Spirit, and a way that we imbue ourselves with the, the knowledge um, and purpose of this glorious faith. It aids us to continue our teaching work and it just solidifies um, the knowledge of the oneness of humankind. It was a blessing for me to be in Haifa with so many people that I'm already spiritually connected with. And for the same purpose that we all have come together under the concept of the pupil of the eye. Before we even knew of the people of the eye, we were, con we were together and connected mm -hmm. with that concept in mind of fulfilling the most vital and challenging issue, which Abdul Baha speaks of in the advent of divine justice. I was blessed to go to Haifa with this group of people. They were an inspiration for me there, and they are an inspiration for me each Thursday when we come back together here. Welcome, everyone. We are thankful for the opportunity to participate in this Bridges presentation. And in these troubled times, we thought we needed to do something special as a service to Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha. And this special contribution we'll make through a project called Drumming Up a Conversation. This is a pilot program, and as it unfolds, it is important that those who are working to connect with vibrant African-American communities gain experience and understanding through conversations that will build love and trust among the participants. Um, understanding, learn, and apply the two for more purpose for, for the trainee. What is two for more purpose? It's about the, the fact that you're dual nature, you're an individual human being, and you've got a spiritual self and a material self. Well, things that happen in the spiritual world does not go through and ask you for permission. It does not go to the mind, can we do this now? It just acts, because the mind is only a tool of the soul. The soul is in charge. Now the dark-skinned people he, Shogirfendi said, would have an upsurge that is both spiritual and social. The spiritual upsurge will rapidly bring them great gifts because this is an act of God. And it is so intended. And all the world's prejudiced forces will not hold it back one hair's breadth. The Baha'is will glorify it and understand it. The social repercussions of race suppressions around the world will increase at the same time. And frightened, the world's forces will see that the dark-skinned people are really rising to the top. A cream that has latent gifts only to be brought out by divine bounties. You know, many times in, 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 in after the integration, uh, it was always difficult for uh, African American men to, or African American young boys, to come together to do some things because it was always dangerous in, in a community to, to group together to do things because the police would always become suspicious of, of you coming together and and you would either be accused of being a gang. I mean, I, I experienced this in Kansas City as a young young person. 
So, it, or you were just standing on the corner talking to your friend. You could get, you know, accused of doing something. And so it became a practice uh, just for safety and security not to come together. And that was very dangerous for African American young people growing up. And so as we matured and we come into a, a large crowd, the African Americans would look across the room at another, nod his head, but he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go because as soon as you go, you're plotting. And we didn't want to be accused of that. So that gathering, the black men's gathering, was very important spiritually. And one of the things that, one of the real, 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 real exciting parts of that was when a father was able to bring his son to a gathering for the first time. And they see and they hear painful experiences that people have gone through just to regain their own spirit. We're not talking about racism and street stuff. We're just talking about gathering of the spirit. So the young men learned that it was okay to cry and to pray to God in that same manner. And we've been, we've been meeting in Kansas City for I don't know how many years now. We started meeting even before the B and was. We were going to be together. And we meet every Monday night, whether we have anything to talk about or not, we eat together and we pray together. And every Monday, rain or shine, and some people call, are we meeting? They said, are we alive? <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, you feel you want to stay home, but, you know, Earl and I have been there, just the two of us, if everybody else was sick or gone or out of town, and we sit there and we enjoy ourselves, you know, even if there's only two. Because two is like ten when you pray. So, <clears throat> with that, first we want to drum. So I'll just use that right now. <laughs> There's that space in transformation that no one knows. That, that space in transportation that you are not too sure of yourself. You know? There's that moment that things change and you go, ooh. You know? Ooh. I, I, you know, you were here and now you're there. And you don't know how you got there. Well, it's one of the magical things and the gifts from God that we have within us, where the spirit and the consciousness connect. Your awareness, you become aware of something, and now you can talk about it. But in order to do that with someone else, you have to reach a point of understanding. And so you're always reaching out to the other guy. Good afternoon, everyone. This is great to see such, um, then first, a number of faces, um, because this is a challenging course, and a lot of people don't survive. And I, when I, I really truly mean that word, survive, because it changes you, it changes how you think, it changes how you learn, it changes, and all the changes that you make are yours. And that's one of the beautiful things about the course. I started this course um, over 20 years ago. I've been saying 20 years for the last 20 years. <laughs> but 
but it's been a long time. I started this course, Intellectual Preparation for Social Action, with a high school here in Kansas City, along with Dr. Um, Marco Rabani, who is a professor at KU. But once you start the course and realize that all things are connected to all things, even in education. Good afternoon. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and be amazed at the amount of stars that you see? How vast our universe is? How was this enormous universe created? And what is my part in this creation? Intellectual preparation for social action is not your normal or typical educational course. It has opened up and challenged me and my understanding of who I am. Stardust. Did you know you are stardust? You may have noticed how different each presentation was. Absolutely different. And, and, and the question is, why was it different? It wasn't coming out of the same book. Well, it was different because it was coming out of each different mouth. It was the absolute reality of each individual. And that shows how different our realities are, even when we pursue the same thing. I was so excited about that. And, and, and many people, as you know, I've done it two or three times. It's, it, it's never the same, uh, because mainly because of the dialogue that's a part of the course. That's, that's one of the secrets, the, the group dialogue. You learn from each other. And, and, and at the same time, uh, you learn more about yourself. So um, we will be learning about who you are. You will be learning about who you are. That's the first thing you do. And some of the words and languages you will recognize like twofold moral purpose, you know, dual nature, we will be using these words and we will be understanding within the context of what we're doing. There's no difference in that. But the two form our purpose is about understanding your spiritual capacities and capabilities. And, and all of you know, if you don't, you know that we are stardust. And I don't hesitate to say that science has proven we are stardust. And so once you shift your mind to these areas, then you start to realize that that you're living this human life and that you have more control over it than you think. And it's that control that's going to make a difference in how you live your life on the other side of the course and how you can help other people uh, when you try to work with young people. Young people get it pretty quick.
mistakes that I have made or any of the things that cause me pain. I am not the pieces of the dream I left behind. I am life. I am life. of it all. 